she sends me a message uh, telling me the bad news. That was a very sad moment indeed. But what can we do? This is life. We won't be here forever. We'll all follow, follow him and follow others. And this is what it's all about. Um, I have uh, a quote I read. It says, the, rush, the, the righteousness perished and no one pondered in, it, in his heart. Devout men taken away and no one understands that the righteous are taken away to be spared from evil. Those who walk uprightly enter into space, into peace. They find rest as, as they lie in death. Maybe they do. But we remain mourning and remembering them all the time. Oh, I wish he or she was here at this time. But it can never be like that. But the only thing we have to do is just to say, to remember them the good way, that they did the best during their time. Now, to put Mendy's family, I would like to say, let's put Mendy's soul rest in peace. He will always be with you. May you find as much joy as you find sorrow in his memory. Put Mendy rest in peace. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Sis Tandi. Um, can we have another song while uh, Babama Busom Simang comes to say tributes to the family? <laughs>
Mendy uh, passed on in the early hours of uh, Monday morning. One person suggested that uh, he, he wanted to wait long enough for Beyonce and Jay-Z to do what they were doing there. I'm not very sure that that was the kind of music that uh, he particularly enjoyed, but then he was quite an eclectic person. But he has had a very long and productive life. As you heard from the obituary and others who have spoken before me, would mainly exclusively, and I mean exclusively, dedicated his life to the liberation struggle. It all started in his youthful days uh, to a point where when he went to university, he couldn't finish, he didn't finish because of his political activities. He then comes into serious employment and he links himself up with Mandela and Tambo in their, um, um, in their attorney's uh, practice. And in the same building, there is a person called Walter Sisulu. So he was really in the middle of uh, the stalwarts of um, our liberation. The Boers banned the African National Congress in um, 1960, and he was one of the first persons to be asked to leave South Africa and start assisting uh, Oliver Tambo, what came to be called the external mission of the African National Congress abroad. Um, when, when we got to Dar es Salaam, I got to Dar es Salaam personally, since you asked me to talk, I'll talk about myself too. See, uh, in, in 1963, in the early 60s, he was already older than many of the young people who were living for military training. We lived in uh, camps or in houses that were set aside for people in readiness for either going to school or going for military training in different centers, different countries, the Algeria, Ethiopia, uh, some went to Morocco, uh, China, the Soviet Union, and most of them stopped over for a while in Dar es Salaam, and the one place that was available for them, which became home, was the Msiman uh, residence. There, with uh, Aunt Egi and the young family, I think we had Kosi, um, Abuto, I think Tanta, no. uh, they, they came to realize that the Msiman residence there was actually a, a home for all the people who were outside of uh, South Africa. Um, the students at Mandela University, <laughs> sorry, at Mandela residence, lived at Mandela residence in Dar es Salaam, would also uh, receive a visit from Uncle Mandy to brief them on how to deport themselves as they went uh, on to take up their assignments um, of further education. Myself, I was not supposed to be a Msiman because my name was Walter Mabusa. But it was a little bit difficult not to go to Uncle Mendy who would make special arrangements to get this uh, Walter Mabuso to come home and uh, spend some time uh, with uh, the family. But really I was one of uh, many uh, of the young people who had the privilege of spending the occasional weekend when you could leave and be, and be with the Simon family. Many was, I uh, don't want to talk about politics because I'm talking family men members now. Lots of uh, others better qualified than me to talk about that. He was a very good office administrator. I guess that would have uh, what uh, attracted uh, Mandela and uh, Tambo to have him as, um, as, the, as their office administrator. 
in uh, Dar es Salaam, he, um, he, 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 let me say, he could write. He, he, he writes, he used, he used to write magnificent. He, there was a publication called Sitaba, which uh, was put together uh, under his supervision, and he would write editorials, impeccable. And most of it was a collection of uh, articles uh, reporting about things that were happening uh, in South Africa. That was professionally run, and soon there were people writing uh, letters, commentary on that. That was all under, at a certain time anyway, under the um, organization of uh, Budmendi. He was a people's person, if that's allowed in English. Um, and really, I struggled to remember when um, I saw him angry. I'm sure he was, he was so human. But uh, it's the kind of, uh, he had the kind of discipline where you would manage that, suppress that, and you didn't really quite notice it uh, easily. Uh, at a certain time, he was transferred to Zambia, and uh, it was not always all work. He was also a bit of fun sometimes. We had, uh, and Dombi and I, Dombi was my late wife, had the privileged responsibility of uh, living with him when he was uh, in Zambia, because Dombi was uh, looking after me as a gorilla, and then any other ANC person who happened to be around, she had a job. Uh, I remember one evening when he came home very late, very, very late, happiness written all over his face, and um, he had to get his food, you know. So Dombi gets up, puts whatever had been prepared in the oven, and then she dutifully serves the uh, menu and makes to take a step away and, and, and go to sleep, it says good night. And Budmeni says, where are you going? Chat to me. <laughs> so she sits there as he eats very steadily, very delicately. And um, my poor wife is very, very sleepy. <laughs> she was the only one who worked among us. Um, but Budmeni just could not allow anybody who was a Makoti to leave him eating alone. Um, it, 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 I was sleeping already. So she sat and chatted to him. She didn't say, talk to me, just chat to me. <laughs> That's an expression that remained as part of the lingo uh, at home. So Budmendi comes back to South Africa, of course, to, to the welcome of this huge uh, Msimam Tabizol or Nongkosi family uh, in uh, Soweto, uh, Gauteng all over, in uh, KZN, and he immediately becomes really the de facto godfather, where people really would come in droves to visit, so whether it was just a private visit or to uh, whenever there was uh, an occasion. Mendy um, and his uh, immediate family were blessed with very long lives. Um, they all went away, those who have, uh, in their 80s, late 80s. I can't remember whether some of them hit uh, their 90s. So we, um, speaking on behalf of the family, are grateful that you all came here to honor a person who really did not just for diplomatic and nice reasons of kindness, spent all his life dedicated to the service of the liberation of South Africa under the umbrella of the African National Congress that he loved so much. Thank you. Thank you, Butch Maduso. Um, our next speaker who will give a eulogy is our minister, our very own minister of international relations and cooperation. Can I ask the choir to just do one short verse as the minister comes up to make her presentation. Thank you. Minister.
Excellencies, ambassadors, and high commissioners who are here present with us, the clergy, distinguished guests, leadership of DERCO, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to start off by apologizing for the poor sound and the lighting. It is not typical of our ceremonies that we have this. Um, there is a glitch that we are trying to fix, and I'm terribly sorry about that. However, it should not dampen our own resolve to make sure that Uncle Menti is sent off with all the dignity that he deserves. Mendim Simang, known to us as Uncle Menti, was a Kada, a gentleman, an officer, an ambassador, second to none. He distinguished himself in every portfolio that he occupied. A beautiful human being. I don't know if uh, Sandile uh, was talking of the same love that I'm talking of, but I loved him dearly. But I am here as his minister, attending to the ceremony of an outstanding and truly exceptional ambassador. My deepest condolences to the family and friends of Ambassador Mendim Simang and his organization, the ANC, for which he gave all his youth and all his adult life. My condolences too to the South African public in the loss of such a wonderful, outstanding patriot of our country. We in Delco will remember him for having put us at a particular pedestal such as we've never occupied in the court of St. James. Angrim Simang would have turned 90 this coming Saturday. However, we are burying him on that particular day. I want to say thank you to the family for looking after this wonderful man. It always happens that people who bestride the world like Colossus, like him, somehow always end up with a family looking after them. 
Thank you so much for everything that you've done on our behalf. Uncle Benji slipped away over a period of time in the early hours of Monday morning. And um, I'm informed at the time that he was slipping away and all of us were very agitated that he consoled himself by singing a song or listening to the song, Ngosi Sigelela. I'd like us to be led by the choir and stand up and sing this song in remembrance of his last moments with us. <laughs> Johannesburg. This no doubt determined his destiny as the officers of the African National Congress would themselves later be located in Marshalltown. With ANC, so to speak, running his blood, Reverend John Simang, Selim Simang, and Richard Simang, his uncles, were founder members of the ANC, where, who were fully involved in the ideology and politics of the ANC. Born of the ANC, lived and worked for the ANC, died for the ANC, died for the people of this country. It was not surprising that Uncle Mendy himself, a founding member of the ANC Youth League in 1944, led the torch that his uncles had given him and became part of those young lions that brought life to the ANC. Clearly, we pay homage to Ambassador Simang, who covered the entire spectrum of our revolution, our coming into a democratic state, led us into the highlights of his ambassadorship, and saw us as we are, and worried about us. And he had every right to worry about us. We need to pause from time to time as we prepare to bury him on Saturday to connect with and remind ourselves of the long, rich history of people like himself in this country. People like himself who led an exemplary life. People like himself who gave everything they had for this country. He gave up his youth, went through the glory days of the Youth League, infused the radicalism that defined the Youth League. He went into exile, as you already heard from the previous speakers, as a pioneer who represented us abroad 
served with extreme diligence, with every, responsible, every responsibility he was given, suffered the trials, tribulations, and tragedies of struggle, bore them with grace that only he could take on. He suffered the hardship that defines all liberators, and he was determined that at all times he would give his best. He spent all his life putting the ANC and the future of the people of this country first. He never spared himself in the struggle for freedom of this country. From a very early age, thus from the time when he was a founding member of the ANC Youth League, he loyally worked with senior members of the organization, imbibing the great values and ethos that drove their principles and courageous struggle for freedom. It was from an early age that he distinguished himself as a hard-working, diligent, honest man with integrity that is so lacking these days. And for me, I worried about the way my old father felt about Uncle Mendy. And I looked at him from time to time and wondered if there were no traces of a Sisulu in him. Now it has been made very clear he is a Sima, and my father loved him for the integrity and outstanding dedication that he had. Uncle Mendy belonged to a generation that bravely responded to the general call for all black people to come forward and be part of the potent motive forces for liberation. This he did because he daily experienced the excruciating and savage oppression to which he and the rest of the black population were subjected to. He was to experience the uprooting of blacks at his birthplace that was declared a white own, only area. Thus he experienced firsthand the viciousness of dispossession of blacks, of their land and their homes. When he worked at the Mandela Tambo firm, he continued to be exposed to the gross degradation and humiliation of his fellow black people. These were people who sought legal intervention in the face of relentless abuse and subjugation. These were his own people who, who daily witnessed every human rights inexorably taken away from them. And there was very little he could do from a legal perspective. And therefore, he made up his mind that the struggle was the only way he could end this for his people. Uncle Mendy's youth was spent in the ANC that was seeking to find a voice and assert itself in the politics of South Africa. Uncle Mendy witnessed the rise and fall of many political movements that sought to eclipse the ANC. He saw with the advent of the Youth League the rise of the new radical agenda of self-determination and self-definition. It was the Youth League of Uncle Mendy and his peers that reshaped the ANC and modernized it as a people's fighting machinery. It was the entry of this core of young people who infused the sinews of the ANC with a new sense of urgency that broke ranks with the half a loaf and half a bread kind of politics. The young people were demanding freedom in their lifetime with unparalleled urgency. For the attainment of their political objectives, this generation was prepared to pay the ultimate supreme sacrifice for the freedom of their people. It was this dog determination that earned them both the praise from our people and the hatred from the regime. The rise of the ANC in the 1950s was mainly a crowning achievement of the work of this generation, including Uncle Mendy. They took the ANC to exile and held it together with fierce jealousy. They sounded the international clarion call about the plight of our people with both honesty and devotion. That is why their pleas were received with conviction. Ankum Samang was a torchbearer and a gallant fighter whose life needed to be celebrated even as he lived. His simple nature and quiet disposition was a great mark of the power of his personality. He did not need to shout to be heard. He, needed, he did not need to bang the table to be given attention. For me in particular, 
whenever I was at Mutuli house, and he said, follow me, I knew exactly what it was we were going to talk about. It wasn't pleasant news. But he didn't need to shout to put that across. He brought back home a united ANC, and his only plea is that we sustain that unity. Not only in the face of how we want to portray ourselves, but truly sustain the unity that they handed over to us. The ANC Youth League that Uncle Nelly joined infused in him a sense of higher calling of national service. The politics of that generation were in many respects radical, but laden with a profound sense of duty and devotion to the struggle of the African people. That generation faced the cruelest form of the rule of the National Party, which took over in 1948. Uncle Mendy was part of the Defiance Campaign of 1952 and formed part of the youth Masubadzilla, who were instrumental in helping organize the Freedom Charter that culminated in its adoption in Cape Town. When the great march against the passes was held, Uncle Mendy was counted amongst those young people who assisted in organizing that historic march. When scores of our leaders, numbering 157, were arrested, on trumped-up charges that led to the treason trial, Uncle Mendy and the Corps of Youth League members helped to sustain the activities of the ANC in the absence of these leaders, and assisted in, assisted in mobilizing political support for the trials, and in particular, su sustaining them financially and ensuring that their legal fees were paid. He also provided much needed administrative support to almost all the leaders in this particular period. When the Rivonia trial began, he was one of the young people who left the country to wage a struggle in exile. You have heard from some of our speakers how he went into exile and how he established himself there and made sure that the ANC lived and the ANC was understood. The first challenge was opening up external bases for waging both the armed struggle and a diplomatic offensive. He was assigned the role of representing South Africa's interest in London later on, and it was a critical assignment bestowed upon him on the basis of both trust and ability. And those of us who studied in Britain spent most of our lives in the weekend in the office in London getting educated politically by Uncle Mendy. The London office which, served as its, which he served as its chief representative played a leading role in mobilizing European support for South Africa and, the so and solidarity for the struggle of the people of South Africa. London became the new running base for the exile activities of the ANC. This fact was given credence by the presence of leading ANC members in the country that included Aziz Pahad, Tabon Bailey, Issa Pahad, Reverend Trevor Huddleston, etc. I could go on. The London office held the fort in sustaining our struggle with the support of many fraternal organizations such as the anti-apartheid movement. Upon, upon coming back, Uncle Mendy served in the first democratic parliament was, and was elected in the first, in the first conference as the ANC Treasurer General. What are the lessons that we have learned from his life? I wish to extract the following key lessons that I think we can learn from his life of service to the ANC, the people of South Africa, and to humanity. He served our people and his organization, the ANC, with profound loyalty. He served our people with sincerity and singular determination. He served our people in the ANC with utter humility. He served the ANC and our people with love, passion, and compassion. And he had enough love for all of us. Let me also indicate those character traits that Uncle Mendy detested. He detested arrogant leadership. He detested and loathed laziness and idleness. He abhorred gossip and rumor mongering. He detested factionalism and clickism. He resented pomp 
and occupied in leaders and follow followers alike. He revolted against corruption, theft of public resources. He hated self-serving leaders and those who indulge in empire building. He hated ignorant leaders and followers alike. Let us take this leaf from his life and see how much better our society would become. Uncle Mendy comes from a generation that understood the value of discipline, of hard work, uprightness of character. These were the values that were expected from all of us, and we demand them on behalf of the government and on behalf of the leading party from all of us. He himself demanded them from elected leaders. Uncle Mendy understood leadership to mean service and not to be served. Service was seen and understood to be a humbling enterprise whose ultimate gratitude was to see the work of the country and of the organization done and done efficiently. That was the ultimate reward of leadership to see the completion of assignments done and duties done diligently. It was indeed insightful of his parents to name him Mendy, the great ship that carried brave African volunteers to serve in the First World War, not knowing where they were going, with no training, with nothing to gain. These soldiers went to fight for what they believed was the right thing to do. The ship sank tragically, and only one thing was recovered from that ship. It was the barrel. As you know, the barrel of a ship is of great significance. It is a siren that indicates when there is danger. In the human being, it is the conscience. Uncle Mendy, in his life, encompassed the entirety of this tragedy in one man. The courage of the undertrodden, their determination to face the world, and the tragedy of their circumstances, but yet hope that would fill their hearts and fill the hearts of everybody today. That once they loved the people who were in the Mendy, who faced the impossible, who faced the unknown, and triumphed only in spirit, that should live on in our lives. The bell, which is a conscience of everybody here, lives on. And that bell was Uncle Mendy. He held that bell in his heart, and I hope that the Defense Force holds that bell with the same kind of tenderness as Uncle Mendy held his conscience. Uncle Mendy would tell us every time when things went wrong. And he would say, Hey, Nid, when the guy Nobody had any answer. Fortunately for us, he was in the integrity committee. And in his time, he was able to tell the truth as it was. None of you will ever understand the loss that the ANC has suffered, the loss that this country has suffered with the men of the stature leaving us. Our hope, our vision, our support, our conscience, he carried us all through all these travels. Today, he is sunk in glory. Let him leave his bell in your hearts. Let each one of us have that conscience that says we must do the right thing at all times for the sake of our people, for the sake of our community. I thank you.
Andrew, can we please stand up after that eulogy just in recognition of our Uncle Mendy and, and really pay tribute to his life. Please, we can stand up and ask the band right at the back, the band, to give us um, some music. Is the band ready to play? Minister, thank you for the kind words that you've just shared with us about our father, about our grandfather. To all the ambassadors and high commissioners present here, we also want to thank you for the messages that you've sent to our residents. Uh, to all other speakers who spoke today, we want to thank you family and friends from near and afar, uh, the choir, the SAPS band, we like to say thank you for today, because every day is a struggle to us as we are trying to say goodbye. And so with those few words, we'd like to say thank you to Babum Funis as he's also going to um, talk to us spiritually. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Minister, allow me to join you in this congregation of friends and supporters in extending the condolences to the Simang family of the churches of South Africa in the South African Council of Churches. I stand here on behalf of a member church, the Roman Catholic Church, whose life and soul is under the ministry of their pastors. I want to read from the Gospel according to Luke. Chapter 4, 
beginning from verse 16. Jesus went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the air of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son? They asked. Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself, and you will tell me, Do hear in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. Truly I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. Now this reading can truly be referred to as a manifesto of Jesus' mission, to proclaim good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom, recovery of sight for the blind, and to set the, free, set the oppressed free. Ambassador Simon would have understood from this text that the message of Jesus is intended to break the walls of racial separation that was the cornerstone of the apartheid ideology. Jesus had told his exclusively Jewish synagogue audience that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet not, he was not sent to any one of them but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon, a non-Jewish region. Time will not allow us to delve deeper into, the, in this, into analysis and interpretation of this text. But brought up as he was as a Christian, Ambassador Simang would have heard this reading and may have had occasion to mull over it. He would have repeated in his young mind the promises that come with this manifesto to proclaim good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free. We would have heard also of another verse of Jesus' sayings. The chief come, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. He would have said to himself, I like this Jesus. I think this is comrade Jesus. <laughs> he would have been challenged by the messages that Jesus uh, gave up, such as, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. And I fear that message must be on for many of the churches in South Africa today. Ambassador Simang would have been even more persuaded by other texts in Matthew where Jesus says, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me and I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, thirsty and give you something to drink? 
When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick and in prison and go to visit you? He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these sisters and brothers of mine, you did it for me. These texts would be his foundation for Christian activism, for social justice. He would have mused over all of this and would have taken it in into his life traveling portmanteau for further reflection. We've heard that Ambassador Simon's family experienced the whimsical population shifts of Johannesburg's unsettling forced removals, dismantling interracial harmony of Sophia Town. He will have lived with the question of the meaning of belonging when your home is never a guarantee of home. He would have mused over all of this and would have taken it all into his life traveling portmanteau for further reflection. We've heard that Ambassador Simang had his family life, his, his, family, his early years of life in the Winnen of Yenen area of KwaZulu Natal. This is the historical site of the killing of Peter Tief and his group of King Dingana's men, by King Dingana's men. This is also the proximity of the site of the Battle of Ingome, otherwise known as Blood River. He would have drunk from the waters of the Vasbang River the liquid ancestors of which would have washed the spears of the great warriors of the place. His grandmother would have passed on to him the alternative explanation of Dingana's attack on Retief, calling them Awatagati, wizards. Grandma would have passed on the explanation of Dingana's treachery as told by Zuri historian Mapalala, how Retief's men were observed on their horses the night before by the royal guards of Kainyan in what appeared to be an attempt to encircle Dingana's great place in Gumundov. These may have been scouts to check out for reliefs, uh, relief security rather than scouts for attack, but nocturnal movements such as those were considered to belong to Abatagati, wizards and witches, people who had ill intent. He would have mused over all of this and would have taken it in, in into his life traveling portmanteau for further reflection. And that reflection would come back to him as he sought to reclaim some of that heritage by farming in the same area in his later years. We've heard that he was sent to St. Francis High School at Marion Hill to escape the troubles of an activist student in Johannesburg. But then he would have walked in the footsteps and come under the influence of Dr. Benedict Villagazi or Wabunin, whose name was to be on the now famous Villa as the street of Soweto, who came from Natal and was baptized, trained as a teacher, and taught at Marion Hill. He would have read some of his works, including his collection of poetry titled Noma Nini. The title itself would have left him thinking, Noma Nini Wilsiglung, much like Gibson Kenter's How Long. As he tagged along with others at the formation of the ANC Youth League in the mid-40s, young Ambassador Simang would have been aware of Dr. Villagas's completing his doctoral studies at Vith University with a thesis on oral and written literature in Nguni and becoming the first black African to receive a PhD in 1946. This would have inspired him to take seriously the value of education, something he would give some of his life to promoting both at Solon Natlangu Freedom College and through the Lutuli Scholarship Fund in London. He would have mused over all of this and would have taken it all into his life traveling portmanteau for further reflection. We come here today to memorialize and celebrate the life of an exemplary and conscientious servant leader, a life that was honed by all these influences which he absorbed and took in as part of his life experience to become the gentle, caring, and serious professional of the struggle for justice with a smile. The informed and informing reservoir of wit and wisdom. The humble and astute tactician who puts no one down and leaves no one behind. The generous and principled leader who leads by conviction and a sense of purpose. The paragon of integrity with the values of selfless service, Ubuntu, justice, and compassion. We celebrate Ambassador Msimang the one who, in his life endeavors, has remained true to that very original Jesus Manifesto, to proclaim good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom, recovery of sight for the blind, 
to set the oppressed free. It is to, this, to the very one who gave him this charge, even Jesus Christ, into whose discipleship he was baptized, that today we commend his soul and the peace and comfort of his family as he goes to his forebears, Onungos. Ono dwara la kwando tumagans, abatwa, abanzi pumshenge ni konsengi njengo sana, abanzi buzi niyama ukweba, ona ba wamsima. Senga tu kemanje, abanzi wele ba kangulungu, less twelve less ten begileo, sawa tabizo, ba wamsima. Nile zaba kuni na ba filagas, oma chinga suma pepe teni, senga tu bangeza, bampele zele blue hambo. Senga tu zingelo zingu sasinga shesha kumshanga bezi nungu. For this grace, we pray that your ancestors by faith, the prophets, apostles, martyrs, confessors, and all the saints who have served God's peoples over the ages may join your ancestors by nature, Om Sima, in welcoming you. Utlaga ni seki ile. Unga biko, opaza msa ile la yako. Zitine singelosi zi ukole lesu benzika abrama umpefumlo wako. And so, the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, and the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit with you now, through this difficult time and always. Amen. Amen. That, oh, Bishop Mpumlana, your, your wisdom and your messages always leave all of us quite moved. And as we close the day, um, Minister and the family, particularly the family of the Msiman, um, we've come to the end of today. Uh, and uh, we understand that the occasion was done in sh at short notice. But we're very, very grateful that each and every one of us who came was here because we were supposed to be here. And so as we finish the day and bid you all a safe journey back home, it's very hot outside. And uh, we thank you on behalf of the Department of Foreign Affairs and on behalf of the family for coming and saying farewell to Uncle Mandy in the way it has been. And as we leave, I also hope that each and every one of us will take a leaf out of the pages of Uncle Mandy's life and think about his passing and what it has meant for each one of us today. So thank you once again for your attendance and we bid you farewell. Can I ask the choir to say one, make one more song as we all complete the day? And I believe there's, just one more there's, some, there's some refreshments um, that have been made available to all of you before you Go home. Thank you very much.